You good wonderful. To- Wonderful. Thanks, Rebecca. Yes, it's wonderful to be with you today with the, with the EGG group and with the IGS. And we are going to start off with Emma first. Emma's at the University of Leeds working with Adam Booth, and she's going to talk to us today about some seismic data. So we'll just do the usual format. We're going to have fifth, three 15 minute talks. They're going to go back to back. We're going to have Emma, then we're going to have second Emma, known as Mickey, and then we're going to have Nico. So 15, 15, 15, and then questions at the end. So Emma, I'll just pass it over to you and in your own time, just, yeah, start us off. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Um, so, oh, uh, good evening, everybody, wherever you are. Um, thank you for coming along. So I am Emma Pierce, as Kate just said, and I'm a final year PhD student from the University of Leeds. And this presentation that I'm going to show you guys tonight is going to be taking you through my research of using a technique known as full waveform inversion to improve imaging of fern. Um, apologies to anyone who might have checked out my display material at EGU as this presentation is quite similar, but I really hope you enjoy the live edition. So we all know why fern is important. Um, it enables us to establish the past climate conditions in the region. And due to changes in the fern's physical properties with depth, geophysics has been a really popular technique to recover this profile. Specifically, seismic surveys, they're popular as unlike other techniques, such as ice cores, um, they're not spatially limited and they're also not intrusive. So traditionally in glaciology, we use a technique known as the Herdlotch v shirts inversion, and this is used to analyze our seismic data to obtain a subsurface velocity profile of the fern. However, this technique has got its limitations as it's limited by simple assumptions of physics as it uses only the seismic wave travel time. So consequently, the, oh, sorry, <laughs> the method has struggled where there's complications in a fern profile, things caused by periods of melt or ice slabs. So this is where we want to introduce full waveform inversion. It's got the ability to potentially mitigate these issues and improve velocity modeling of fern, helping us to produce more precise images of the subsurface. It's also a very popular technique used within the exploration industry. So throughout the next uh, 15 minutes, I'm gonna take you through what we might need to do in glaciology to introduce this technique into seismic data sets and see where we can go from there. So, in short, what I'm going to do is take you through how we go from a seismic data set on the left, so this image here, and we are going to end up with a subsurface image of the fern, which we can see something like this, where we can see what's going on below us. So the data set that we're using to establish the potential of FWI is Pine Island in Antarctica. It's a data set provided courtesy of the British Antarctic Survey, and it was uh, collected as part of the ISTAR project. There's three main reasons that we want to use this data set. Firstly, it's got an accumulation rate within those that we've used with synthetic tests with FWI and seen that can work successfully. It also has a thick steady state firm profile of around 120 meters with no complications, which is what we want to be able to test the technique. Secondly, the data has been acquired in the BASH traditional seismic acquisition technique, which we can see in this bottom image here with the expanding geophone array. So it means if FWI does work with this data set, then there's a whole archive of data sets at BASH and other places that have been acquired in this way that we could potentially get a lot more information out of. And um, finally, um, we also acquired, or there was also a density log acquired at this site. So that means that any models we run, we can actually get a form of ground truth to see what, um, how accurate the output really is. So the actual data that Bass acquired was three seismic shots, and these have been um, combined to give a single seismic gather shown here with 108 traces and a maximum offset of 980 meters. As the data consists of three shots combined, we actually see varying wavelet shapes in the near, mid and far offset. And this will become more important later in the talk, but just bear that in mind. Um, for those of you who don't have your eyes into a seismic data set and aren't too familiar with what we're looking at, I've pointed out sort of like the key things for you. So what we've got here is an air wave. So this is essentially the sound of the explosive source that you um, detonate being received, recorded by the receivers. 
And then we also have the refracted arrivals. And these are the bit that we really care about. They're the bit that carry the information about the fern and the subsurface and travel through the fern and what we with FWI want to be able to replicate. So perhaps now's the time to sort of take you through what FWI is. It's an iterative inversion scheme that in each phase produces an update to a best guess starting subsurface model. And from this updated velocity model, we generate a synthetic data set, which we then compare to our true field data. And we generate a residual, which is the difference between this true data and um, model data. We then use this residual to guide our update to produce a data set that would be a better representation of the subsurface and better match our field data. And we essentially continue this until our model data is as good a match as our field data as possible and we're not seeing any updates anymore. And at this point, we have our final model. So to use FWI, you need three main inputs and these are a starting velocity model. So this is what FWI is going to update and improve upon. We need an estimation of the source wavelet. So for example, in Pine Islands, that will be an estimation of what the explosive source signal is. And finally, obviously we need some seismic field data that has been acquired potentially with FWI in mind. Or in this case, we're looking to see if that can be an archive data set. Something that goes hand in hand with FWI and that we need to talk about is a phenomenon known as cycle skipping. It occurs when this forward model data that we produce is too far away from the true data and that the residual that we generate, so the difference between these two data sets isn't uh, really useful. And the update that the model produces is a poor update and not representative of what's going on in the subsurface. So as shown by the figure here, what happens is that your peak in your seismic data actually matches with an incorrect peak in the real data. And therefore your update just essentially catastrophically collapses and you get nonsense out. This is something that with FWI is your limitation and something you really need to think about from the start. And there's a few ways that we can aim to mitigate this. The first is by having as good an approximation of the subsurface as possible before you start. The next is by having a really good approximation of your source wavelet. And finally, it is by modeling in the lowest frequencies first. So we want a data set with low frequencies. And at this point, um, it's important because lower frequency data have a longer wavelet. So here they are less sensitive to um, errors in your starting model and your source signal. So to first establish the potential of FWI, we started with synthetic tests. Um, to do this, we generated a set of synthetic fern profiles using the Heron and Langway fern densification model. And we used snow accumulation rates and temperatures consistent with those seen across Antarctica. And you can see these in this graph here. Um, the acquisition geometry of these was also set up in line with the, what we see with the BAS data, such as using a single seismic source and having a maximum offset of 1,000 meters. So the first set of tests that we ran with these synthetic profiles were to use the Herglotch V-shirts technique, so the traditional glaciological technique with seismic data, as the starting model for FWI and to see how FWI dealt with this and whether it could improve upon the model. And what we saw is that in the situation where Herglotch V-shirts a, gives a really good approximation of the subsurface, FWI actually can't really do much with this and it um, doesn't update the model further because Dutch research has already done a really good job of this. And this can be seen here in the left where the blue represents a good match between our true data and our field data. Um, and our NR NRMS values, so the value between how different our true data and model data are, are both staying the same for FWI and the real data. But what we did see was actually if Herglotch v gives an output that is different to what the true firm regime is in the subsurface, FWI can take this and push the velocity model in the right direction and give us a better approximation of the subsurface. So here we can see how the FWI model goes more towards the blue colors and matches really well. So in short, for these models, what we see is that FWI can basically act as a control on Herglotch v -shirts either uh, keeping the profile the same or improving upon what it has produced. 
The second set of tests that we ran were adding an ice lab into the phone profiles. As we know that Herglotch research struggles when there's the presence of ice labs in data. This is because it can't deal very well with lossy inversions, so it can often see the top of the ice labs but never detect the base. So we fed um, FWI a simple starting model uh, and the true data had the presence of an ice lab in it. And what we can see on the figure on the left is actually that FWI is able to detect this ice slab and sort of give us a good understanding of where the top and the base of the ice slab is with that data. Although in similar ways to Herglotch v shares, if your ice slab is very shallow and thick, all of your seismic energy is going to be critically refracted. So unfortunately, FWI won't be able to work with that because that energy isn't propagating below the ice slab and you're not carrying any of that information. So the synthetic results look really promising for FWI. Um, so how do we transition this to field data? When dealing with field data as opposed to synthetics, there's a few challenges that we have to face. Firstly, as mentioned about cycle skipping, things we have to do is approximate a source wavelet, and this is really important. In synthetics, it's really easy to do this because you just model everything with a Richter wavelet and that problem's gone. But in field data, it's something that you have to really work to get a good approximation. You also need to get a good starting module. And also, since our field data was acquired with an explosive source, low frequencies in the data just aren't as prevalent. So cycle skipping is going to be something that's easier to occur. And we have to compensate by our good wavelet match and our good starting model match. So the starting model for Pine Island, we were fortunate that we have both the density core, which we could convert to a velocity profile using the Cohen approximation. And we also produced a Herglotch research model for this data set. And we combined these because what we saw from the synthetic data is that a good velocity model match in the near surface really helped to produce a successful FWI update. So we combined these and we got a starting model for the data set. We then had to um, address some prerequisites that you have to do for FWI. So these were extracting our wavelet, which we did by aligning and stacking all of our traces and uh, windowing around what we would assume would be the first arrival and essentially testing different wavelets and seeing which produced a data set that had a smallest mismatch between that real data. We then processed our data and got rid of any uh, frequencies that are unusable. So FWI is a really highly computationally intense process. So high modeling to high frequencies just isn't feasible at the moment with um, what we have. So we basically have to cut off anything above 100 hertz and just really focus on the lower frequencies in our data. And the last thing we do is we ray trace with the starting model that we had to get a good understanding of where our data is sensitive to and what area of the firm we're actually imaging. So here you can see that um, the rays are imaging approximately the top 50 meters before they're being critically refracted and they aren't returning to the receivers. So we can give a good understanding that FWI will be able to match uh, image in that top 50 meters. Uh, next slide. Come on. Okay. Um, so at this point, we've got everything that we need to run FWI. All that's left is to feed everything into the inversion, start with the lowest frequencies and hope that we're able to combat cycle skipping and see that FWI conversion our data produce a really useful velocity update. Um, so if we take a look at our forward model data, so the, our real data is shown in the black, and this is the data that was acquired on Pine Island. And our red data that we're modeling is shown, our data that we're modeling rather is shown in the red. Um, and what we can see is I've highlighted some key features in boxes. So in the red box, we can see that we're getting a bad data match in the very near offset data. Um, and this is cycle skipped. We're also not really representing any of these slow arrivals in the turquoise box. But actually at far offsets, we get a really nice data match. Um, the limitations here is that the bad match in the near offset are causing cycle skipping. So annoyingly, we're not able to run FWI with this at the moment and produce any um, 
velocity models. But this limitation is coming from the extraction of our wavelet. So because the data set was collected with these three individual shots that were combined, the extracted wavelet um, is using the signal from the far offset data, hence why we're getting the good match. But the near offset is generated from a different wavelet. Uh, so this is highlighting the limitations and the key focuses that we need to pay attention to when we are in the field and collecting data for the potential to use this technique. Um, so this isn't it for FWI with field data at the moment. Um, fortunately, we've been able to collect some data in Norway with everything we've learned from using the BAS acquisition and taking this into account and really narrowed down our um, repetitive and concise source signal, the lower frequencies in the data, acquiring this very near surface constraint on the velocity. And we're putting all this together to hopefully get some really good results for FWI. But at the moment, that's where I am. And um, yeah, in conclusion, the synthetics are really promising for FWI. Our um, results were really promising for using it as a constraint on Fernan to recover or detect rather the ice labs. But uh, the transition to field data is naturally less simple as things like extracting the source wavelet is never gonna be as easy as it is in industry where that wavelet's known um, from the modeling. But FWI is a really interesting technique that could have a lot of potential with, in glaciology, with fern just being one area that we've looked into. Um, and I mean, I personally am quite excited to see where FWI leads us. But thank you all so much for listening to my talk. Um, I am currently a, lot, a final year PhD, so if anyone's got any cryosphere seismology postdocs, hello. <laughs> but yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Emma. That's really exciting as well. I can see that you're excited for the project. And I'm certainly <laughs> I'm positive that you're going to get really exciting postdoc opportunities. So, so please oh, do please reach out to Emma. That. You know, she's got her contact details on the screen there. So you'll be able to pick oh. those up on Facebook afterwards. So thank you very much, Emma. We're going to swiftly move across to Mickey. Emma, you'll see that there's some questions in the chat. So we'll pick those up later on. And you'll have a bit of time to think about them. OK, now I'd like to introduce Emma, who's called Mickey. Mickey Mackay here, and she's from Stanford University. She's going to head off to the University of Florida very soon, um, but talking to us today um, as a representative of Stanford University. So I'm just going to head over across to you, and you can get started. Thanks, Kate. Um, yeah, I, my name is Mickey. I'm a member of the Stanford Radio Glaciology Group, and like Kate said, I'll be starting a faculty position at the University of Florida this fall. I'll be building a group centered around uh, machine learning applications to the cryosphere. So if that's something you're interested in, or if you're a prospective PhD student, please reach out. I would love to, to talk. Uh, but today I'm going to talk about how we can use geostatistics to better characterize subglacial conditions. Subglacial conditions, including the geology, topography, and hydrology are all really important for modeling ice flow through the routing of ice and water or through the reduction of basal friction. These conditions are especially important for making accurate retreat projections at Thwaites Glacier. For example, this modeling study by Byron Perzek has shown that the choice of, uh, of your bed rheology can make the difference between retreat and stability at Thwaites Glacier, making these uh, conditions really critical. Uh, the main way we can observe subglacial geology is through seismic surveying, where the acoustic impedance can be used to discriminate between a soft and hard bed lithology. However, this particular survey makes up only a very small portion of the Thwaites Glacier. So this information isn't really sufficient for parameterizing uh, ice sheet models at large scales. Uh, with, uh, we, with ice penetrating radar, we can get more information about the subglacial topography. Uh, for example, we have hundreds of thousands of line kilometers over the Greenland and Arctic ice sheets shown here. However, these measurements have to be interpolated. And the way we usually do this, for example, with Kriegen or spline interpolation, uh, creates unrealistically smooth topography. For example, this large area over here where there is very little data has a bed slope of effectively zero for hundreds of kilometers. So that's the problem. And that's because uh, traditional interpolation methods like Kriegen are designed to optimize local accuracy over geologic realism. So for example, here I've taken some subaerial topography from Greenland and extracted lines to represent 
uh, a radar survey, and then interpolated it with creaking. And so the result is much smoother. It has these uh, bullseye artifacts. And, and this is what you know, our, our ice sheet investigations rely on, when in reality, that looks more like this. We can do a little bit better than creaking with the mass conservation inversion, where ice surface velocity and ice flow dynamics are used to constrain uh, topography interpolations. However, this method is only effective in high ice velocity areas shown in pink. And this method is, uh, or in this particular inversion is undetermined and it still creates smoothing. I will also note that when we use topography inversions and basal friction inversions in ice sheet models, we are using model parameters that are defined using the model itself. And that introduces circular logic into our ice sheet models. So it would be really great if we had an alternative way of characterizing these conditions. And that's something that can be achieved with geostatistics. The idea behind geostatistical simulation is that you generate many realizations of a feature in such a way that you're reproducing the spatial statistics of the measurements. So for example, say you have some blue topography measurements. If you do creaking, you're finding some sort of average uh, solution to this problem. But the black lines uh, show many different topographic realizations that simply uncertain uncertainty space and all have a much more realistic roughness. And this produces uh, topography shown here. And so this kind of approach is commonly used in groundwater hydrology, mining, and oil reservoir modeling because it's been shown again and again that it's advantageous to account for subsurface heterogeneity when modeling these systems. And there are a lot of applications in, in glaciology for using uh, where, where this kind of bed surface is much more uh, compelling. So in this talk, I'm going to show you two case studies where I have used geostatistics to constrain subsurface conditions. In the first example, I'll show you how I've used geostatistics to model subglacial hydrology. And in the second, I'll show you uh, how I've used geostatistics to map the geology of Thwaites Glacier. Subglacial hydrology has an important control on, on ice flow. For example, uh, meltwater runoff is, has been, been linked to increase in ice velocity in Greenland. And it's really important to know where that meltwater goes under the bed, where, where it's flowing. However, our water routing models rely on uncertain and highly simplified bed topography. Uh, so uh, we still don't quite know where the water is going. So I propose using geostatistics uh, to generate many realizations of topography so that we can route water on each of these and get a, a bigger picture of, of where the water is flowing and quantify our uncertainty in water flow paths. In this particular uh, example, I was generating simulations that account for information from ice penetrating radar data and from the mass conservation topography from bed machine. Uh, so this simulation matches the exact uh, measurements shown in the radar data and has the same spatial statistics shown here, uh, but maintains the same degree of correlation between the radar and the mass conservation topography. So in this way, we're uh, capturing the long wavelength information from, from bed machine, um, but achieving a much more realistic uh, small scale topography. And we can use this to generate many realizations. I then applied a water run model to each of them and found that while the flow paths uh, are the same across uh, in, in the dominant topographic features, there are many places where the channels differ. For example, over here, these flow paths terminate in different locations. So this tells us that we can't use this information at face value. If we take an average of many hydrological realizations from these uh, simulated topographies, we can visualize our confidence in the location of different flow paths. So for example, these areas have a lot of uncertainty in subglacial flow. And this could be used to uh, add context to geophysical measurements or plan surveys. Um, and could also be used to, to interpret which regions might be the most susceptible to, to water piracy or rerouting across catchment boundaries. So in this way, I've used geostatistics to provide a more robust uh, dynamic uh, uh, visual of, of subglacial hydrology. Now onto the geology. What's the geology of Thwaites? Well, this is literally a multi-million dollar question. It's the objective of fieldwork uh, related to the International Thwaites Glacier Collaboration, uh, particularly uh, with respect to the time project. We know a lot about the marine floor geology right offshore of Thwaites and Island. Um, and we know from, from acoustic data and from core data that Paleo Pine Island Glacier uh, has undergone a gradual retreat after the last glacial maximum across the sediment uh, bed, but then once the ground line 
transition from a soft to hard bed lithology, the, the retreat rate accelerated. So this is telling us that there are these two different kinds of beds that have very different controls on ice flow. And we know from bathymetry data that the roughnesses in these two areas are very different. There's this you know, hard distinction between topographic roughness for a hard bed and a soft bed. And if only we could project these relationships under the ice to characterize a soft bed and hard bed under all of Thwaites. So I propose using geostatistical simulation to do just that. Um, uh, so I'm going to use simulation to simulate topography across this region, and then we can uh, uh, transfer that relationship beneath the ice. But this simulation has to be done in such a way that uh, topographic roughness is allowed to, to vary based on, on the local topography. So to do this, I use a non-parametric uh, simulation method based on training, training images. And so the idea behind this method is that you search a training image for patterns that are similar to the data near unknown grid cell, and then you use those patterns to fill in the blanks. And this allows you to construct complex morphologies. However, these, you know, the Thwaites is, is a little more complicated than this example. Um, for example, we have much more complex features here than in this example. And also, what do we use as training data? We have some swath uh, radar here and a bunch of bathymetry data, which uh, you know, provides some, some good initial training information, but this isn't necessarily representative of the entirety of Thwaites Glacier. So I create an augmented training image data set uh, using uh, sub-aerial topogra topography from Arctic DEM. I sample training images from all over Arctic DEM uh, to, to create 166 candidate training images, but which training images do we use where? So to answer this question, my colleagues and I developed a training image selection method where we divide the, the data at Thwaites into blocks and then select the most compatible training images based on the patterns in the Thwaites data and the patterns in the images. And we find the ones with the most similar patterns. So then we can use these uh, training images to generate simulations. I start with the most data dense areas and work my way out. And this gives us uh, a topography simulations with realistically rough topography and variable morphology based on the local measurements that we can then use to make this a geologic classification based on the roughness. We have a largely soft sediment seafloor, uh, hard bed lithology in inner island bay, and then sub, uh, subglacial weights is, has a largely mixed bed rheology with, with more sediment than bedrock. And so this kind of information could be very useful for initializing basal friction coefficients or for uh, using it with a, a spatially variable sliding law. So here I've used geostatistics to connect the marine and subglacial environments. At the moment, I'm working on developing an open source geostatistical software so that anyone can use these methods in their own work. I'm working on adapting these methods to internal layers, ice shelves, and, and sediment core interpolation. And I plan on developing machine learning tools for integrating other sources of geophysical information into uh, these subglacial estimates. This is work that I will continue at the University of Florida. And I'm particularly excited about this opportunity because U of F has recently upgraded their supercomputer with NVIDIA hardware. So U of F now has the most powerful uh, supercomputer in academia, making it an ideal environment for doing large scale for ice sheet scale machine learning problems. Uh, so if any of this is uh, something that you're interested in or want to get involved in, or you know anyone who uh, wants to do a PhD in machine learning and glaciology, don't hesitate to contact me. I would love to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was wonderful. And I'm very much looking forward you know, to, to reading that paper when it comes out. I see the in prep there. And I'm very much looking forward to you know, having a look at that paper. So thank you very much for that, Mickey. And yeah, you've got our contact detail there. So if you have any questions, Mickey, please pop out or not. You're, you're online with us on Zoom or on Facebook and we'll come up there. And then we're going to head across to Nico. Nico, you can pop up your slides. Wonderful. So Nico is a PhD student at the Alfred Wegener Institute, second year. And he's going to go off to Greenland now to talk about great ice course. I'm just going to head off to Great, thanks. Yeah, we go back to Greenland now and um, I talk about the impurities and the deformation of this ice core and this is definitely not just work by me but by a lot of other people. Uh, some of them are mentioned down below. 
but I will focus on the stuff I've been working on over the last couple of years. Okay, so let's go. First of all, I would like to have you have you have a look at this little image here. And as you can see on the left, you have a line scan image of this eScript ice core, and it's nicely visible that you have those cloudy bands. So layers in the ice with a lot of impurity content. And if you look into the microstructure in the middle and on the right, you can really see where those tiny dots, uh, solid particles in the ice are located. And this is why I'm going to head today because I'm trying to combine the microstructure. So grain size, grain shape and grain orientation and impurities. And this has been done for quite a while. But why is this important? If you see this little video here on the left, um, you see ice being deformed and all those grains you can you hopefully see there. They change shape and size, but also the orientation. And it doesn't matter what glacier or ice sheet or ice cream you look. If you want to understand the flow of ice, you somehow also have to understand the details, the microstructure, the internal information on this very small scale. So we're talking centimeter to millimeter scale here. And just one example, just imagine that these are ice crystals or ice grains. So it's pretty much the same here. Um, and you can see how they deform. So if they have been in there for several thousands or even ten thousands of years undergoing rain and stress. They, of course, deform into impurities to reflect to the impurities. They can impact the deformation of those ice crystals. Here are just two examples. Um, impurities can drag the grain boundary um, and they can them. So the grain boundary movement, those, uh, the changing of the shape you see here on the left can be impacted by impurities in the ice. And this is um, not new. This has been under debate for yeah, several decades now. And a lot of studies have been dealing with this over the years. And I just put together a big list here. So please don't go into detail here. And they have been using several methods, several ice cores, several approaches. But what we get to in the end is that we still have some very ambiguous results. Um, there are several reasons for that. I will not go into detail here. But we still don't really know where those impurities are, if there is a preferred orientation, and what they do in detail. This seems to be really dependent on the state of the impurity and also on the ice sample and the ice core, of course. OK, so what about this eScript ice core now? Um, maybe you haven't heard of it yet, but this is a deep ice core, which is currently still being drilled in northeast Greenland on the northeast Greenland ice stream. And is thus the first deep ice core from such an ice stream, and therefore super important to understand the deformation of ice better. Um, and therefore, of course, it's highly interesting for all people who are somehow working with deformation in ice and uh, the flow of ice, of course, regarding um, future sea level rise. Um, okay. And what's really cool about this core is it's still being drilled, but we already have a lot of data. So CFA data, um, IC data and physical properties data, which are line scans, um, crystal orientations, and a lot of other uh, properties, which I will briefly touch here. Um, and therefore, I would just show you very quickly, if you're not too much in this field, how this is being done. So we really take samples every 10 to 50 meters in the field. We polish the surface of those samples. And in the end, you have thin and thick sections, which you can measure. And what you have in the end, you have those nice little crystals. Um, if you've been looking uh, closely at Emma's first slide, you have seen the anisotropy and the crystal fabric. And this is what we get in those thin sections. So each color here um, represents the crystal orientation of the single grain we've cut off. So this is what we get. And from this, we can derive the deformation regimes which are present in this ice core. And this is just the sketch which I did and down to 200 and 120 meters. This is how far we've got so far. And you can see that we have on top vertical compression, as you would suggest or yeah, as you would expect. And then we really have this extensional deformation. So the ice stream does somehow pull the ice um, away. But there are some very detailed changes in there. So they are still being um, debated. And there's a lot of cool stuff being, working, uh, being worked on. And unfortunately, we had to stop in August. And yeah, last year we couldn't go due to Corona, of course. And this year we also can't go. So, so far we are stuck with those 2,100 meters and there are still 500 meters to go. And especially the most interesting part of the ice core. So the very uh, part close to the bedrock, of course. So hopefully it will work out next year, but we'll see how that goes. So. 
I will just give you an overview about the Holocene ice of this ice core. So these are roughly the upper 1340 meters. And what I've been doing over the last year with the lab hasn't been closed. I was uh, making microstructure maps. So you have your ice sample and you take a scan of the surface and then you focus into the sample and then you make another scan, stitch those images together and you can come up with the so-called impurity map. Here you can locate impurities. So we focus on solid inclusions because we're using the microscope, so it's visible. And then we are using cryorama spectroscopy, which is a method where you can shoot with your laser at on those impurities. And if you're lucky and you hit them, here's an example of those. You get a spectra, which you can then identify and you know the location, so the microstructure and the chemical uh, composition of this impurity. So what kind of mineral they are, for example. So, and we've been doing this for several samples and here's just the workflow again, just to take you through it very briefly. First, you have the surface scan. We map the grain boundaries. So those are those violet lines. Then we have the impurity map 500 micrometers below. Um, all the yellow dots are uh, particles we've been counting. And in detail, it can look like that. And then in the end, we try to measure as many as possible, as many inclusions as possible with Raman spectroscopy, which is quite a tedious operation and takes a lot of time. Therefore, we only get a certain percentage of each sample. But in the end, you can say, okay, we got mica here, quartz, gypsum, hematite, whatever in those locations. And um, we did a bit of statistics here. So I will just briefly touch this. There are more details in the preprint, which is hopefully which is hopefully soon available at the cryosphere. And we also measured the grain, a grain boundary area. So those violet lines, if you just uh, take the area of those and we counted the inclusions at those grain boundaries, they are enlarged. So this is an upper limit estimation, but that's the easiest way to do it since we're in the ice, we're not on top of the ice and you have a bit of uh, light fraction and other things. And in the end, it turns out that roughly 30% of all inclusions are located at grain boundaries. And the grain boundary area is roughly 25 to 26%. So quite similar. This varies with depth. And therefore, we came up with this ratio. Should we just divided the amount of micro inclusions at grain boundaries through the uh, grain boundary area. And here, if it's one, it's perfectly the same. And um, our values show that there is some variation, but we also, there are slightly more inclusions at grain boundaries than you would expect from the grain boundary area alone. But still, the majority of inclusions is in the grain interior, not at the grain boundaries. And now to the chemistry, please don't get lost in this plot. I know it's very full, just to give you a brief overview so we could analyze and identify a lot of different minerals. And what's really interesting here is that at 900 meters, so this is where this red dotted line is, we have a large shift in neurology. So on the left-hand side, these are the shallower samples. And there are a lot of different sulfates, like gypsum, for example, which is the most common one. And a lot of terrestrial dust, like quartz, feldspar, and mica, which you get from dust storms from Asia, for example. And below 900 meters, uh, there's a shift and the shift is a bit easier to see here on this plot. So now I just plot the sulfates. And what you can see is that the diversity drastically decreases. So on the, on the right hand side of this uh, red line, you, all know, uh, you almost, almost have gypsum. So this appears below 900 meters. So something is still happening down there or has been happening roughly 7.6 thousand years ago. Um, we are still working on that and we are trying to get more samples from the glacial to have a closer look into that. Um, but it's pretty exciting stuff and hasn't been that clear before. And the other part, the uh, location of those impurities, I will just mention some uh, details here. So for example, there is a really strong trend of spatial patterns. So here you have the strong layer of uh, inclusions. And if you look closely, you can see that mainly those sulfates tend to cluster together. Uh, and this is true for the entire core for all the samples we've been looking at. So all the orange uh, dots and the blue dots are sulfates. So blue is gypsum and the orange dots are different sulfates depending on the chemistry. 
but if you look through those samples, it's mainly sulfates, which tend to cluster. And here's some examples from uh, deeper samples. And you again have those strong layers of sulfates up here. And here it's strong gypsum layer, for example. And then again, a lot of clustering. And once we go below 900 meters, at the bottom right here, um, there are no sulfates. We only have gypsum, those blue dots. And they also don't cluster that much anymore. OK, so we try to put this together in the sketches here. And there's this certain trend in the upper Holocene, so the upper 900 meters. We have large grains. We have a lot of sulfate layers and clusters, gypsum all over the place, and also a lot of mineral dust. And for the bottom part of the Holocene, we just call it the low Holocene. So, uh, there's, we have larger and smaller grains because we're getting close to the glacial. And there's only gypsum as the only sulfate. We have nitrates and some other uh, changes in the chemistry. And um, yeah, as I said, again, more details are in the preprint, hopefully soon available. And now, instead of taking the real conclusion, I just wanted to mention some interesting challenges ahead. So of course, there's a real debate going on what happens to those inclusions when they are coming to Greenland, when they are being deposited, wet or dry deposition, they're being drifted around, there's sublimation and diffusion going on. So we are really not still entirely sure what all those processes which are going on, how they affect our our inclusions. And um, it has been shown that there's a lot of chemical reactions going on in snow. And this is probably also true in ice. And therefore, uh, we we think that there is still really, really much to, to analyze and to understand regarding chemical reactions inside the ice column, if those uh, inclusions and impurities have been there for several ten thousands of years, it somehow makes sense that they react and from different minerals, for example. So this is one aspect then, of course, regarding this uh, abrupt shift at 900 meters, there have been upscale changes in the scene in northeast Greenland. The ice sheet has been retreating and advancing, and also the sea ice cover has been changing. So um, maybe that's related to that. So some reg regional changes, um, and yeah, we're still looking into that. And um, maybe some of you have some good ideas about that. And also, now we come back to the start somehow, we are on this ice stream, and therefore the ice we are looking at wasn't deposited at the place where we are right now. So ice. From, from the Holocene did come from a different place further upstream, as you can see on the right. So you can see the, the approximate age and somewhere between 10 and 15,000 years, the end of the Holocene. Uh, yeah, there are, this, uh, these are roughly a couple hundred kilometers away from the East Grip Ice Wall drilling site. And therefore this upstream effect is being worked on. There are a lot of uh, colleagues of mine who are working on this stuff. And there are a lot of little pieces which still have to be puzzled together but um, yeah, this would be a great chance to somehow get this microstructure and impurity thing back together and maybe to get some new insights into the deformation of the light streams, which is of course highly important. And with this, I would like to finish and just do a bit of advertisement for another very cool topic. So snow on sea ice. I've also been working on that uh, as a student some years ago. So I'm definitely checking out next, the next presentation by Martin Schneebeli on snow on sea ice during the Malik expedition. And with that, I'm finished. Thanks. Thanks, Martin Eagle. What perfect time talks. I'm very lucky. I um, really enjoyed I think you're absolutely right, these puzzle pieces. And you know, I can see that for all talks today that we're all kind of building on those puzzle pieces. Thank you very much for all the really well. It's been fantastic questions. Oh, you can see the chat. Motions and use the stop, you know, please take a question to chat. Please call me to read the head of the end of the first question there. And you chat, you've got yeah, I think the very good work if you can way forward and hopefully the transition to look at things like radio and any sort of elastic will uh, follow suite. Um, to answer, is it Francisco? Um, and yeah, if you want, if you're happy to be good. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, no, you um, go. Yeah, yeah. The uh, Antarctica data was collected using explosive sources. There was three different explosive sources with varying amounts of like detonator cords. So that's why we sort of see this really distinct variation in source wavelet. The Norway data that we've collected, which seems to show a more consistent wavelet and better for FDI, we've actually just collected with hammer and plate source. Um, a shout out to Adam Booth because he is a very good hammer um, and gets very good data. Um, uh, and um, for the looking at the three different wavelets individually, 
um, and then like standardizing them at this point there's really no difference to just generating a synthetic wavelet that best represents all three because you're moving so far away from like what the true source wavelet is and trying to combine them that it doesn't really work you just end up poor data match for everything rather than like a one good bit and one bad bit um but yeah there are really questions thank you everyone wonderful thanks Thank emma so if any of you want to follow that up with emma you know you've got a contact details you can pick those up later on um i think there's a question for you on facebook that i can see on the screen actually um do oh. you do you do raw error analysis between the observer data and the model and, and what methods are there so like the um analysis? the data difference that we do between the observed and the model data is just the least squared like data residual so we literally just subtract the um raw data model data from one from the other but you can do sort of different uh, cross correlation methods to look at the data residual or just simple travel time differences um depending on sort of what algorithm you have and what's working best for your data you can change around with these and yeah see what works best wonderful thank you very much um we'll pass across to a question from mickey then mickey sasha, sasha's asking you know what roles do you see for radar reflection amplitude and specularity you know what what roles they play in informing your machine learning mickey yeah, that's a really good question. So the challenge with using radar reflectivity is that we don't have labeled trained data to learn from. But we can, you know, run that by doing some unsupervised learning methods. We can use that to see how separable the radar data is to see it automatically you know, classifies these data regions. Interestingly, now that I've used it just to, you know, get an interest of GLG beneath the bed, we can also use that as weak training labels to do a more formal supervised learning analysis of the radar. So I think there are, you know, all kinds of you know, clever ways you can triangulate um, you know, into using radar in, in a more uh, structured way to classify the GLG. Wow. Okay, so that's a great question. <laughs> Did that answer your question, Sasha? Well, a couple of things that I completely never thought of, which is extra awesome. Thank you. That was great. Let's talk. Yeah, that's what we want you know, from these careers you know, to kind of invoke ideas and, you know, kind of facilitate those discussions kind of moving forward. Yeah, so thank you very much for, for all those questions there. That's wonderful. I'll just wait and see if any more are coming through on the chat or on Facebook. I know that Rebecca is monitoring Facebook for us. Um, lots of fantastic um, comments here. I think you know, that everybody really enjoyed your talks. Um, lots, lots online. Lots of applause for you online, Nico, um, as well. So that's just really great to see. I think um, you know everybody's very much in awe of the work you're doing, and uh, the, the talks were just spot on today. So, so well done to all of you. I'm just going to wait and see if there's any more questions coming through. Any last minute thoughts there? Um, Okay, Roger's got one for you, Mickey here. You know, are the clusters big, broken, green? It, sorry, broken, bigger, green. Is that for Nico, actually? Roger, do you want yes, to Nico, explain that yep. one? Typing too quickly yeah. with a bit. Okay. <laughs> too excited, yeah. Okay, over to you, Nico. So the clusters of sulfides, for example, if they are in bigger greens, if I get that correct. Um, good question. Actually, I haven't really looked into that yet. Um, I should check that. Just my visual eye, I think not mm, that I know of, or that doesn't catch catch your eye right away. But I, I can check that. Yeah, we're still trying to do some grain size analysis and all that stuff. Um, but yeah, that might be a good good thing to follow up on. Thanks. Yeah, it sounds like there's an awful lot still to do with the project, Nico, and I'm really looking forward, you know, to when you can get out back to Greenland and get that deeper core as well. Hopefully that will happen kind of within your PhD, because that'd be a really nice way to kind of pull everything together, wouldn't it? Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, I think we're about to head out time there. So I just really want to, you know, thank everybody. Thank the three of you for speaking today. Thank Rebecca for her beside the scenes behind the scenes work and and obviously tv um you know we're very grateful for her staying up there Susan, and having us all here today so as nico said we've got an exciting speaker next week um i've just scribbled down the name yeah, it's martin schnabley and he's going to be talking to us about snow on ice next week and um, so i hope you can all tune in for that and come prepared with your questions then so once again i'd like to thank all the speakers um you know we're all clapping for you behind the scenes um, and uh, yeah, we hope you have a very good, yeah, thank you very much. We hope you have a very good evening or morning or afternoon, wherever you are. Okay, thank bye you. for now. Thanks, Emma. Yeah, thanks. thanks. See you next week. See you next week.